Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Music and worship during this season I love because we sort of all take a step back and we're reflective and we're remembering that the infinite, majestic, amazing God who created all of us stepped into our world, into His creation, into our brokenness. He came near and walked with us and touched us. God, the Word became flesh. Oh, it's my favorite. I mean, He entered our mess and He lived for us and He died for us and then the Father raised Him from the dead. But, I mean, Christmas is when He came. We need to sit back and think about what that means and how miraculous that is, that we're not left alone, that we're not just wandering around down here. I think the hope is that we begin to really understand what joy and peace look like. The great thing about Christmas is that there's a constant reminder all around us. Advent's just an exciting time to, to really think about. We have a Savior who, he, he came for us once and He's coming again. He's coming, like this is, a, this is an exciting thing that He's gonna save us. You know, to that we just say, how can it be? We want to adore uh, our Savior um, and we want to proclaim Him as worthy. I think when you really look at Jesus and who He is and all He's done, I mean, He's God, yet He became man. Um, and you really think about why He came. He came to love us. He came to go to the cross. Then the only response that makes sense is to adore and to say thank you and to worship just God with us. It changes everything. Cling close to a Savior. Draw close to one who created you um, and find peace and joy in that. It has nothing to do with, with looking right and singing the right words and doing the right things, but it has to do with worshiping Him and how we live and how we walk with Him. I mean, really worship is just us responding as He reveals his truth and His life, we just respond. I mean, it's not just on Sunday, it's every day. A life laid down in gratitude and, and faith is just saying, yeah, I believe. I believe that this is true, that you are with us. And adoring is the only thing that makes sense. I mean, we see who He is and how good and kind and faithful, how He loved us sacrificially to the end. That's the only thing to do is adore. Amen to that. Oh, come, let us adore him. So we're going to continue on in this series of uh, the season of Advent with a series that we're calling, Oh, come, let us adore him. Focusing on the concept of worshiping our Lord. And so, and, and textually, the way that we'll be doing this is by looking at several of the characters who are most closely associated with the birth narrative of Jesus. So I'm glad that you're here. Welcome today. If you're in Center Court East, welcome. If you're in Center Court West, welcome. If you're in the Woodlands, welcome. If you're online, however it is that you're here today, we're really glad that you're here at Faith Bridge um, as we worship together. So as I was mentioning, we're in that Christmas Advent season, which leads us to Christmas Eve. Now, in your uh, bulletin, you have a little postcard like this. Everybody does. It's partly to remind you of Christmas Eve services, but by virtue of the fact that you're here today, you probably are already kind of on to Christmas Eve services. What we're really going to ask you to do is not just put this up on your refrigerator, but why don't you give it to somebody who's not maybe thinking about Christmas Eve services? Because You've heard me say it many times before if you've been around. Christmas Eve is just one of those seasons that in God's great plan, it seems like people who really don't think much about God and Jesus and the Bible and church and stuff are actually a little bit open to it if they just had an invitation. Statistics show 
they would many times say, yeah, I'd probably go to a Christmas Eve service if somebody invited me. So why don't you invite them, bring them here, and let's see if in God's great plan they could hear the gospel that afternoon, that evening, and maybe something would click inside of them and they would respond and their souls would be saved and lives would be changed. So you'll be thinking about who you're going to bring, who you're going to give this to uh, this next week in your life. All right, so uh, here we go on this new series. Let me introduce to you Adam McIntyre. Don't really have to introduce him to you because he's preached several times uh, for you. For four years, he was one of our student pastors, did a fantastic job with our youth ministry. And so this past summer, we moved him up to our young adult ministry where he's doing an awesome job as well. And he has a very thought-provoking, challenging, uh, appropriate message for us today as we start in on worship. So let's welcome Adam as he comes to preach God's word to us now. Thanks, Tim. Well, good morning and welcome. So excited to be here with you guys as we get to talk about worship this morning. Specifically, we'll get to look at the lives of the shepherds to discover how they worshiped their King Jesus. And growing up, I always, I was led to believe that worship was singing songs to God. And no one taught me that directly, but I was able to gather it from context clues. Anytime I went to church, when the person up front would say, let's all stand for worship, I knew that meant it was time to sing some songs, right? And my parents, they always listened to worship music on the worship radio station, KSBJ. And they would get me worship CDs for Christmas, because what 10-year-old boy doesn't want the new Twilight Paris album in his Christmas stocking, am I right? My parents, they gave me very memorable Christmases, just so you know. But parents, take note. Sandy Patty, she's coming back. I heard she's making a comeback. So, you know, that could be a good Christmas present for your kids. Uh, the reality is um, that growing up, I never really heard about worship outside of music. Like, I never heard things like, hey, have you read that new worship book? Hey, have you seen that worship movie? Hey, have you done that new worship activity? Worship was always synonymous with music. And the reality is that worship is so much more than music. It's so much more than just singing songs to God. The actual definition of worship is to ascribe worth to someone or something. So when we say, let's worship God, we are declaring him to be worthy. Worship, worth-ship. And so this morning, as we dive into the story of the shepherds, my prayer is that we are able to see that Jesus is worth so much more than just our songs, but that we are called to worship him in every aspect of our lives. So we are going to be in Luke 2. If you have your Bible, Luke 2, we're going to start in verse 8, and we're going to read through verse 20. If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand. We have ushers coming down the hot aisles, and they'd be happy to give you one. If you don't own a Bible, please keep that Bible. We love you. We want you to have it. So Luke 2, 8 through 20, it'll also be up on the screen. Here we go. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. And they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, she treasured up all these things, pondering them in her, in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So for a lot of us, 
This is the 10th, 20th, maybe 100th time that we've heard this story. And that, mixed with the fact that we are about 2,000 years removed from this event, means that this story has lost a lot of its impact. And so in order to regain the impact that this story originally had, I want us to take a look at who these shepherds really were. Because during this Advent season, we are exposed to many different portrayals of the shepherds in Luke 2. Most of them look like Hallmark cards. They're very sweet and idyllic, very peaceable. The reality is that in this first century setting, the shepherds were viewed as some of the lowest of the low. The Pharisees deemed them to be unclean and would not allow them in the temple to worship ever. They were unclean because they worked with unclean animals and they were constantly dirty. Their clothes were always dirty, their hands were always dirty. In fact, the Pharisees would often use the term shepherd as a slang for sinner. And even outside of the Pharisees, the shepherds had a reputation for being rough, violent men. Most people, when they would see a shepherd, they would automatically assume that man is a criminal. And there's a reason why they had the reputations that they had. And there's a reason why they were up all night guarding their flocks. These men were not into sheep because they were sweet-looking props for their nativity sets. For these men, for these shepherds, their sheep was their livelihood. Where we see sheep, they see dollar signs. They see stock portfolios. They see walking retirement plans. That was why they were up all night. They were guarding their livelihood from predators who would come and try to eat the sheep or from enemies who would come and try to steal the sheep or they were just trying to keep the sheep from running away. They were constantly fearful, constantly stressed, constantly anxious about protecting what was theirs. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Like, try to put yourself in the shepherd's shoes. Like, imagine if someone took your paycheck that you get every two weeks, and they dumped it in $10 increments in little piles all over your front lawn. And then here's your 401k in this pile. Here is your stock portfolio in this pile. Here's your savings account in this this pile. I bet that you would be up all night too, gun in hand, guarding your flocks. I bet that you would be constantly stressed and anxious and fearful as well. My point is, that these shepherds were likely rough and violent men because they had to be. And so it's a bit shocking, and it's a little bit strange, that the angels would appear to these men of all people. We might have criminals standing around in our nativity sets. That scene around the manger might be a little more scandalous than we ever imagined. So now that we know this about the shepherds and we know a little bit more about the first century setting that they were in, I want us to notice the truly amazing part of this story. The angels proclaim to these rough, violent men a message of peace on earth. That today, a savior has been born in the city of Bethlehem. And as a result, the shepherds leave their flocks to go out and search for him. Can you now see why the story is shocking? This is something that shepherds never, ever do. Shepherds never leave their flocks, ever. To do so would be to risk economic ruin. Really, you're risking your entire livelihood. But for the shepherds, finding this newborn savior was worth it. Jesus was worth them losing everything. And so the shepherd's primary act of worship is not found in verse 20 when they were praising and glorifying God on their way home from Bethlehem. No, their primary act of worship is found in verse 16 where it says, and they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. They were willing to risk losing everything in order to find Jesus. We don't know if they lost everything. We don't know if they lost anything. But for the shepherds, it didn't matter. They left with haste because Jesus was worth it. The pursuit of Jesus at the risk of losing everything, that was the shepherd's primary act of worship. Earlier, 
I asked us to imagine what it must have been like to be in the shepherd's position, to constantly be on guard, fearful and anxious that some predator was going to come and steal your things or some enemy was going to come and destroy your livelihood or that your things would just get up and walk away. And the sad thing is that for most of us, myself included, I don't think this scenario is too hard for us to imagine. For a lot of us, this might be our current reality. For most of our lives, we stand around protecting what's ours. Our neighborhoods, our homes, our 401ks, our incomes, our jobs, our status, our reputation. We are just like those shepherds, constantly keeping watch over our flocks. And as a result, we are tensed, suspicious, and fearful, always ready to pounce. I can see it every single time I turn on the news or I watch one of those political debates. I would say that fear is the main theme of every news broadcast and political debate I have seen in recent memory. Who or what is going to come and steal from me next? What enemy is plotting to destroy my livelihood next? When is the next economic downturn or stock market crash that's going to send my income and securities running for the hills? Who or what can save me or protect me from all of these things? So many of us are in the same exact place today that the shepherds were back then. We live in a rough, violent culture that is known for being suspicious and anxious, paranoid, fearful, hostile. The good news is that the same Savior who was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, who the shepherds found worthy of risking everything to go out and find, that Savior still reigns as king to this day. The problem is that so many of us hear this good news of great joy that the king, he's finally here, and we're like, yes, the king, he's here, but we refuse to leave our stuff to go out and find him. We are over here shouting our worship songs, worthy is the king, while we simultaneously spend all of our time and our energy and our attention guarding all of our stuff. We might even venture to take a few steps towards Jesus, but then we start fearfully looking over our shoulders at all the things we're leaving behind. What's going to happen to my money, my stuff, my income, my security? What's going to happen to all those things if I begin to focus more on Jesus than than I focus on this stuff? Or what if, what if I follow Jesus and then he asks me to give up something that I really don't want to give up? And so then we turn around and we fearfully run back to protect all of our things. And listen, I'm not saying that in order to follow Jesus that you're going to have to give up everything that you have, that you're going to have to sacrifice everything that you have. In fact, a lot of what we have should be seen as gifts from God that he shares with us out of his overwhelming love for us. What I am saying is that when we cling too closely to all of our things and it consumes most, if not all of our time and our energy and our attention, and we become petrified at the thought of losing our things and we become violent and oppressive and hostile towards anyone who would dare separate us from our things, then these gifts have become our gods. And that's a problem. Your words might declare, Jesus, you are worthy. But your actions, your thoughts, your time, all declare that this stuff, this this is what is really worthy. And you're not just declaring that to God and you're not just declaring that to yourself. You're declaring that to the entire world. Everyone can see what you're doing. They can see through your words. They can see what you spend your time on. They can see what consumes your thoughts, what you put all of your attention towards, all of your energy towards. They can see it. One of the most crucial elements of worship that people often miss is that worship is inseparably linked to mission. We Worship God by declaring to him that he is worthy. And then our mission is to declare to the world, hey, Jesus is worthy. They are two sides of the same coin. 
And so if we are declaring to Jesus and to the world by our, by our words that he is king and that he is worthy of our trust and our obedience, yet at the same time, we fall prey to our fears and we trust more in our money and our stuff or in other people to protect us than we trust in the promises of Jesus, then that's what makes us hypocrites. And instead of being a light that pushes back the darkness in the name of Jesus, we end up feeding that darkness with our fear and our anxiety. But when someone truly does find Jesus worthy of following and they surrender themselves to him, all of this, then that person truly is transformed to become a light in the darkness. That person becomes known by their hope, by their joy, by their peace, by their love, not by fear, not by stress, not by anxiety. No, they're reflecting their king. I met a guy a few weeks ago, his name is Josh Walker, one of the coolest guys I've ever met. He's one of those guys that as soon as you talk to him, you know, like, I want to hang out with you. You're a really cool, cool dude. And uh, Josh spends a majority of each week doing prison ministry. He ministers to both people in prison and he ministers to people who are just being released from prison. And so he asked me, hey, would you want to come with me and uh, do some ministry with people who are just being released from prison? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I've never done anything like that before. I'd love to. Secretly, I was pretty terrified. Honestly, I, like, like I said, I'd never done that before and I had no idea what to expect and I was pretty intimidated at the thought, but also excited about what the opportunity could hold. And so the way this portion of his ministry works is that he and his team uh, show up to the Greyhound bus station. So when prisoners are released from prison, they are released from the Huntsville prison and they get on a Greyhound bus and they are dropped off at the Greyhound bus station in downtown Houston. So Josh and his team are there with brand new shoes brand new clothes and a brand new duffel bag because when the prisoners are released, they, all they have are their shoes that they got in prison, the clothes that they got in prison, and a potato sack with a handful of their belongings. It's literally a potato sack. And so Josh and his team, he meets the prisoners or the people who've just been released from prison and he gives them new shoes and new clothes and new duffel bag so that they can get rid of all the things that remind them that they just came from prison. And they can restore a little bit of dignity into their lives before they go home or before they go to the halfway house or wherever it is that they're going. And then as they give them the new things, they ask, hey, can we hear your story? We'd love to talk with you. And they'll talk for as long as the people are willing to, and then they'll pray for them. And then they'll give them one of these wristbands that has a website and a phone number that they can call if they ever get in trouble, if they ever need help. And so I went with Josh to do this, and it, about 40 prisoners were released that day. And out of the 40 prisoners, about 20 came over and talked with us. And so we gave them the shoes and the clothes and the duffel bags. And, uh, we, and we talked with them. And one guy in particular, I got to talk with for quite a while. For the purposes of this story, we'll call him John. We'll say his name's John. John was a very intimidating looking man. He uh, had tattoos covering most of his body. He was wearing long sleeves and he's wearing pants and you can tell he was growing out his hair and his beard to try to cover up all of his tattoos. You can tell he was ashamed of them. But the only place he didn't have tattoos was really just right here on his face. And John proceeds to tell me his story. And he tells me about how when he was early into his teenage years, he was recruited into a gang. And that were really, that was the only life that he knew. All of his friends were in this gang. A lot of his family was in this gang. And so that's just what they did. So he joined that gang. And I asked him, which gang was it? And he wouldn't tell me. But he said, have you ever seen that show Gangland on A&E? I was like, yeah, Kathleen, my wife Kathleen and I, we've seen that show. And he goes, let's just say our gang has been featured in one of their episodes. Out loud, I said, oh, okay. In my head, I'm thinking, That's terrifying. Like, oh my gosh, like, I realized in that moment, this person grew up and existed in a world that is completely foreign to me, that I cannot ever understand. Might as well have been on a different planet. I can't even fathom what he went through growing up. And he proceeds to tell me a little bit about the gang. He says, you know, they're really big on loyalty um, and always watching each other's backs. And so in that regard, it kind of felt like a family. And then he tells me about prison life. He wouldn't tell me why he was arrested, but he said it had something to do with gang-related violence. And so while he was in prison, he tells me that the atmosphere in prison is incredibly dark. 
incredibly violent and oppressive. He said it's, it's broken up by race. There's the white gangs, the black gangs, the Hispanic gangs, and so forth. And they all hated each other. And so you were constantly watching your back, constantly fearful about getting jumped or stabbed or worse. He said, but he ran with his gang and they watched each other's back. They were loyal to one another. After being in prison for a decade, he says he doesn't know why, but one day he decides to pick up a Bible and read it in his cell. And he reads it cover to cover, front to back. And then he immediately starts over and reads it again, cover to cover. And then he starts over. And he said, somewhere along the way, the gospel got a hold of him. Jesus transformed him somewhere along the way. And he decided, I want to obediently follow Jesus. Which, as I'm sure you can imagine, is incredibly difficult to do in prison. And so he made this decision to obediently follow Jesus, which means that he had to slowly remove himself from the life of the gang. And he had to slowly stop doing the things that his gang would do. And this gang that's big on loyalty did not like that very much. So then he shows me all the scars that they gave him. He shows me all the scars along his forehead and along his nose where they beat him almost to death as a warning to not leave the gang. And then after that, he lifts up his shirt and he goes, I was stabbed here. They tried to kill me. And then a different time, he lifts up his shirt and he said, I was stabbed here. But he, he's smiling and goes, but Jesus protected me. And then after many failed attempts to get him back in the gang and to kill him, they eventually began to leave him alone. And he was able to obediently follow Jesus for the rest of his prison sentence until he was released that day. And then he looks at me and he says, whenever I read the gospel, whenever I read about Jesus, I had never experienced a love like that before. And I'm hearing a story and I'm having to choke back tears because this is the last place that I want to cry, right? Like, that's not a good idea to cry here. Uh, so I'm choking back tears. But here was this man who was so transformed by the gospel. He found Jesus so worthy that he was willing to put his life on the line to obediently follow him, and he had the scars to prove it. I can tell you this right now, if I didn't know Jesus, this ex-con with tattoos covering most of his body would give me more of a compelling reason to go out and search for this king than any sermon or song ever could. This man's very life was a proclamation of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to heal and to transform and to overcome fear and darkness. He was willing to risk everything to know Jesus, which was his spiritual act of worship. And as a result, he was transformed to become a light in the darkness, which is his mission and is the mission of every single Christian. That's our mission. So how do we do that? How do we go about declaring to Jesus that he is worthy with more than just our words? How do we show the rest of the world, hey, Jesus is worth following, how do we show them without just telling them? What do we do? For the shepherds, they declared Jesus' worth by trusting that he was worth searching for and then obediently leaving their flocks to go out and find him. Trust and obedience. Those are the two keys of worship. We Worship Jesus by trusting that he is worth surrendering our entire lives to, and then we obediently follow him in every area of our lives. And this doesn't happen immediately. Trust is something that has to be built. Obedience is something that must be practiced every single day. And believe me when I tell you that I know that this is not easy at all. In fact, it's terrifying. It's scary to trust Jesus enough to loosen our grip on all the things that we hold so dear. Especially when all these things do provide us with a temporary sense of comfort. They do. If we are worried about our finances, then getting that raise makes us feel more comfortable. 
If we are anxious about our status, then buying bigger and nicer things makes us feel more confident. If we are worried about our reputation, then getting that promotion at work makes us feel more powerful. If we are worried about our safety, then buying that new gun or installing that new alarm system or taking a karate class makes us feel more secure for a while. We feel more comfortable, more confident, more powerful, more secure for a while. But what has actually happened is that we've just grown our pile. And now we have more things to be anxious about. Now we become even more stressed because we have more things to protect. And all these things that were supposed to give us comfort now produce in us even more fear. And we look at the shepherds who were willing to risk everything to obediently go out and search for Jesus. And we look at someone like John, who was willing to risk his own life to obediently follow Jesus, and we wonder, how can they do that? How? It's because they heard the angel's message in verse 10. Fear not. I've got great news. The Savior is here. And they believe that message to be true. Fear not, the Savior is here. God and the flesh is here in our very presence. He came here out of his overwhelming love for his creation to repair that what's been broken, to heal our pain. And by his life, death, and resurrection, he has rescued us from the evil of this world. He has conquered sin and death, enemies which have plagued us from the beginning, enemies which we could never hope to defeat on our own. So that everyone who submits their lives to him and obediently follows him as king will experience the undeserved grace and everlasting love of God for all eternity. Fear not. The Savior, he's here. The same message that the angels gave to the shepherds 2,000 years ago, they give to us today. Nothing's changed. The Savior is here. What is there to be afraid of? What are you worried about? You're worried about the economy? Just wait until you discover the kingdom of heaven, which is like a treasure buried in a field that any man, upon discovering, would joyfully sell all of his possessions in order to have it. You're worried about your status, you're worried about your reputation. Just wait until your self worth is found exclusively in knowing that you are perfectly loved by the king of all creation, just as you are. What's the biggest thing there is to worry about? Death? You worried about death? Jesus defeated death on the cross and in his resurrection, and he promises the same resurrection to everyone who follows him as king. Death is no longer an issue for us anymore. Death is no longer something for us to be afraid of if we trust in the promises of Jesus. Every single day, all of us are faced with numerous opportunities to place our trust in Jesus and then obediently follow him as our king. To choose hope over fear. To choose grace over hostility. To choose love over hatred. We're faced with those choices every single day. And here's the beautiful thing. The more that we let go of all these things, and the more that we trust Jesus and we learn to obediently follow him, the more our eyes are opened to the eternal and our worship for him grows. We become more and more aware of how truly worthy he is. And at the same time, we become more and more aware of how truly temporary all of this stuff is. It's going to go away. You can't do anything to stop that. It's going to turn to dust, no matter how hard you cling to it. The more you realize that, the more your fears and anxieties of losing all of these things, they fade away as well. And here's one thing I can tell you for sure. Jesus truly is worth it. In fact, Jesus is the only one worth surrendering your entire lives to. Jesus is the only one worth risking all of this for. And if, slash when, you finally do trust that he is worth submitting your entire life to, submitting all of this to. 
and you decide to obediently follow him in every area of your lives, your life will be transformed. You will discover a treasure of infinite value. You will become a light in the darkness, a person known more for their hope and joy and love and peace than for being suspicious and anxious and fearful all the time. Worship will not just be words that you say or songs that you sing. Your very life will be an act of worship. Your existence will be an act of worship. Fear not. Let go. And go out and search for the Savior. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, God, I just pray that right now, um, every single one of us in this room, which I would guess is most of us, who are experiencing anxiety and fear, um, we're stressed about um, things we could potentially lose or things going wrong. God, I pray that right now, your Holy Spirit is moving in us to show us that you, um, God, you are truly worthy surrendering all this to, of following completely. I pray that you open our eyes to the fact that when we trust you and we obediently follow you, then that stress and that fear and that anxiety, it fades away. God, I pray that we come to understand that you truly are the king of all creation and that you are worth our entire lives and that you give us the strength to obediently follow you. God, we're so thankful for your love, so thankful that you've come here to offer us forgiveness and grace and mercy so that we can know you, so that we can follow you. God, we love you so much. It's your name we pray, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, and I am here with young adult pastor Adam McIntyre, and he just brought the first part of our new series, O Come, Let Us Adore Him, a look at worship. Welcome, Adam. Thank you yes. so much for being here. Okay, so today we looked at the shepherds and what we can learn um, from Scripture from the way that the shepherds worshiped yeah. Jesus. Um, a great look at, at that. And you told so many um, stories of transformation, uh, particularly the one around the prisoner yeah. that you met um, through the program that you went and helped with. Um, we did kind of have a question that came in around that that you can clarify and maybe speak sure. more to his story. Um, so you, you said that he was ashamed of his tattoos right. and um, was that an assumption or is that maybe a conversation that you had with him? Yeah, no, he, he came out and told me that that was why he was wearing long sleeves and that's why he was growing out his hair was because he was ashamed of the tattoos that he had. And it wasn't, he wasn't ashamed that he had tattoos. He was ashamed of what his tattoos represented. Mm -hmm. All of his tattoos he got while he was in the, in the gang and they all represented his old life. Mm -hmm. And so he was covering them up because that's not who he is anymore. He mm -hmm. was transformed and he became a completely different person. And so he was trying to cover up the physical reminders of who he used to be. What a great, powerful story of yeah. transformation. Um, and then uh, just talking about the shepherds, you presented a lot of information about the shepherds. Mm -hmm. I think um, very accurate pro projection of how um, Sometimes in scripture, we, we kind of see them as we want them on the Christmas card right. or we want them um, cute and cuddly and fuzzy yeah, like the absolutely. sheep. Um, but you, you gave us this picture of how they were outcast and what a, what a powerful picture it was that they were the first to receive yeah. the message. Um, talk more about using the word criminal as a shepherd. Um, there, was a, there was a question that came around that. What gave them the reputation of criminal? Um, can you talk more about that? 
Yeah, I mean, it was one of those things that uh, regardless of whether or not they were criminals, that's just kind of the reputation that they gained. In fact, um, even outside of the Pharisees, like a lot of the businesses in Rome would have posters that would say shepherds are not allowed inside because for whatever reason, they were known as a people who comes in and steals things. Um, and so that was, again, uh, whether it was deserved or not, that was just kind of the mm -hmm. reputation that they earned. Um, and uh, I mean, it's in all kinds of different history books, even outside of just theology books. You can look at just gen general history books from that first century setting and mm -hmm. see that shepherds were not liked very much okay. at all. Um, and you spoke to me a little bit before about just Jesus being compared to a shepherd. Yeah. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah a lot of times we, we read the verses about Jesus being the shepherd and we assume, oh, well, that means that Jesus is uh, the one guarding his flock, protecting mm -hmm. his flock, uh, leading his flock. And that, it does mean that, but it has a double meaning. He willingly took on that title because of the stigma that it had at the time. He knew that to be a shepherd meant to be the lowest of the low. And that's exactly who he was. He humbled himself completely to be a servant. He was mm -hmm. a homeless king, mm -hmm. essentially. Not a, I mean, that's what he was. Mm -hmm. uh, and not only that, but he knew that with that title shepherd, that also um, people would assume that they were criminals. And Jesus was crucified as a criminal. Mm -hmm. Most people who didn't follow him viewed Jesus as a criminal, as an enemy of the state. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus took on that title as kind of like a, a double meaning. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I love this look at worship and how it's more than just singing. Yeah. And sometimes that's what we relate it to. And so I'm excited to continue in the um, series. So thank you for your perspective today. Absolutely. Enjoy. Very much enjoyed yeah, it. And thank me. you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here for part two next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.